It is sometimes said that the Romans were nothing but practical, that they favored experimentation which only led to discoveries for directly applicable concepts. In the case of medicine, this holds true. The knowledge, theory, and practice of medicine in the classical and late antique world came straight from Greek sources, but as far as its application to war was concerned, the Romans improved upon that knowledge, theory, and practice, learning how to care for grievous wounds sustained in battle, how to cure diseases, to the extent that a culture lacking the germ theory of disease could, and within the military, especially the military camp. Hospitals were established, staffed by Medici. The Medici appear to have been a type of soldier rather than a soldier of a particular rank or a particular station. Unfortunately, due to source limitations, there is little we can say for absolute certainty about a legion's medical staff. Medici are present in all of the different military units, from the actual legions, to the Praetorian Guard, to the urban cohorts, to the Equitae Singulari. From surviving inscriptions and documents, Medici appear to have been either officers or were of a rank comparable to an officer's standing in authority, as the names of Medici are listed alongside the names of officers as relayed to us, for example, on a monumental inscription in the city of Rome. We have other evidence which suggests that ordinary soldiers, not necessarily part of the Immunes, a legion's corps of specialized troops, were classified as Medici, with the term Medici Ordinari often showing up when they are listed alongside officers. It's been suggested that while all Medici were medical staff, those designated Medici Ordinari actually served in the ranks while those designated simply Medici were attached to a legion, but without a combat role. We also have two other terms showing up in the sources, optiones vetudinari and capsari. Much like the Medici, we simply don't know as much as we would like about these positions, and unfortunately, we know less about them than we do about the Medici. We do know that the optiones were classified as immunes, and if we take their title at its word, hospital officers, then they might very well have been the ancient Roman equivalent of nurses. The term capsari comes from the Latin term capsa, a word referring to a box which contained bandages and other medical equipment, so people in this role have been theorized as being responsible for dressing wounds and other forms of medical support, although another idea is that they functioned as more of a clerical role because the boxes could also contain scrolls. So, what did Roman military medicine actually look like? Well, here we are fortunate to actually have some medical manuals surviving, but the most complete of them is still problematic. This is the manual known as De Medicina, and the historian Patricia Southern says the following about it. On the campaign, the work of the Medici would include treating those who had fallen sick, but the treatment of wounds is much better documented. One of the best-known manuals is that of Celsus who wrote his De Medicina in the early 1st century AD, relying heavily on Greek works. He writes about diseases, pharmacology, therapy, and surgery. Some of his cures for disease could only have increased the mortality rate, and it is not certain whether the Romans fully understood contagion and the efficacy of isolating patients. In dealing with wounds, however, Celsus either had valid experience of his own, or had gained knowledge from someone who had seen medical service in the wars. He was more of an encyclopedist than a serving medical officer, but nothing is known of his life. Writing under the Emperor Tiberius, he could just possibly have witnessed the many battles in Germany and Pannonia during Augustus' reign. We have Roman hospitals attested in at least two places, the legionary fortresses of Atera and Novasium, as well as several auxiliary hospitals along Hadrian's Wall. These were usually courtyard-style buildings with cubicles opening off the central area, and it was here that the advice of those medical manuals was often applied. Unsurprisingly, due to the nature of ancient warfare, there was a great deal of concern with treating wounds inflicted by arrows, javelins, and other missile weapons. Assuming that the weapon had not severed any major ar assuming that the weapon had not severed any major arteries or other blood vessels, then standard procedure was to draw it out the way it had gone in. But if it was firmly embedded or broken, and was deeper in the body than it was protruding from it, the body would be opened on the other side, opposite the arrow or javelin head, and the weapon would be forced through the other side of the limb and drawn out. If, however, it was something like a broadhead arrow, then this could not be done because it would cause excessive bleeding and a larger wound, so a device called the cyathiscus, 
a tool with a hooked end and a hole on that hook, would be inserted into the wound, hooked onto the point, and used to help draw out the head. Of course, if none of this worked, or if it became infected, the limb could be amputated with a combination of knives and saws. Kelsus instructs how to do this. When gangrene has developed between the nails and in the armpits or groins, and if medicaments have failed to cure it, the limb, as I have stated elsewhere, must be amputated. But even that involves very great risk, for patients often die under the operation, either from loss of blood or syncope. It does not matter, however, whether the remedy is safe enough, since it is the only one. Therefore, between the sound and the diseased part, the flesh is to be cut through with a scalpel down to the bone, but this must not be done actually over a joint, and it is better that some of the sound parts should be cut away than that any of the diseased parts should be left behind. When the bone is reached, the sound flesh is drawn back from the bone and undercut from around it, so that in part, also some of the bone is bared. The bone is next to be cut through with a small saw as near as possible to the sound flesh, which still adheres to it. Next, the face of the bone, which the saw has roughened, is smoothed down and the skin drawn over it. This must be sufficiently loosened in an operation of this sort to cover the bone all over as completely as possible. The part where the skin has not been brought over is to be covered with lint, and over that a sponge soaked in vinegar is to be bandaged on. The remaining treatment is that prescribed for wounds in which suppuration is to be brought about. Lead bullets needed to be extracted with forceps, but if they were embedded in a joint, then the bullet had to be extracted by cutting a V-shaped incision around it, and the joints had to be slightly pulled apart. Stab wounds and lacerations would be cleaned, sterilized, and sewn up to prevent infection. Stab wounds or long lacerations were, actually, probably the least deadly as far as these things are concerned. If blood needed to be staunched, then linen, usually known as lint in Roman sources, made sterile by boiling vinegar, would be stuffed into the area, and then a sponge would be applied on top of it. Of course, if the wound was too large to be stitched, the Romans employed fibula, an ancient form of safety pin. The problem, though, is that on a battlefield, not every wound is as nice and neat as a stab. What if a soldier suffers blunt force trauma or had a piece of their shoulder hacked off? In that case, similar methods applied, but the patient was also treated daily with more antiseptics, which brings the video now to pharmacology. Stab wounds, cuts, broken bones, and other trauma suffered on the battlefield might require surgery or at the very least, painkillers, and Roman surgeons prescribed plenty of those for recovering soldiers, along with plenty of bed rest, on comfortable platforms that were not raised at too much of an angle, but not lying flat either, so that blood would not have an opportunity to pool in the limbs. More often than not, opium was prescribed, but if surgery had to be performed, the Romans actually had an ancient form of anesthesia. The roots of the mandragora plant would be soaked in wine, and the concoction would then be drunk by the patient, which, God willing, induced sleep. The Romans used an antiseptic formed by mixing honey and wine together as well as boiling water, boiling vinegar, and boiling wine. So, even without the germ theory of disease, they appear to have understood the necessity of good hygiene and sanitation in a hospital. Roman manuals also stress the importance of good nutrition and easily digestible foods in recovery. Archaeologists have uncovered the remains of peas, lentils, beans, and eggs in at least one Roman hospital. Of course, the Romans also believed things that we today now are pretty ineffective. Manuals discuss the benefits of cupping, drinking various potions made from ground-up charred animals, etc. So, despite the strikingly modern look of some Roman medical tools and procedures, Roman medical science still had its fair share of pseudomedicine, which possibly did more harm than it did good. But, if you survived, the Romans did appear to understand the need for long-term rest and relaxation. And if you were lucky, we have more than a few doctor's notes which prescribed a lengthy trip by the Mediterranean Sea.